Those are essentially useless outside of China. Because China has thirty. Uh, and that was a national person that they are free. Well, um, but um, Google just did the same thing. Google just did the same thing. Google just did the same thing. To Turkey, they cut off access to Google Play simply because Turkey said you're doing a competitive activity. The same thing to competitive activities that the EU is seeking for, Russia is seeking for, the US is probably going to sue them for, which is a tiny Right. So now they're going to be like, well, you, yeah. They're going to ask the Chinese if they can get to the Russian company to pull them out. So it's just kind of like, okay. Why are we in NATO together? What what is this? <laughs> this is really weird. It's like super awkward. Yeah. Also, the fucked up thing is but then they started buying some Russian radar, like old radar system. And so we're like, that we can't have that. So they're like moving production of the F-35 out. And they're like, the F-35 doesn't, like, it's so stupid because the radar system from Biden in Russia doesn't really work, and the F-35 doesn't really work. So it's, it's all just kind of ridiculous. <laughs> what? Yeah, it sort of feels like we're ambling towards World War One, but like without, without really knowing which weapons work. Yeah. <laughs> like the weapons will be horrible, but we're not sure how. <laughs> Boink. <laughs> How was your? How are you? and is coming back in so many exciting ways now. But I also want to help take a moment to thank some of the uh, folks that helped put tonight together. So we are in a place called the Old Stone House. It is a community center uh, here in Park Slope. Uh, Kim, who is at the door, is the director of the Old Stone House and holds special events all the time. It has a gallery downstairs. Uh, a lot of families in this area who come through for kids' events, but they also do interesting evening events. They always have uh, local and contemporary artists displaying their work on the wall. I encourage you afterwards to check out the art, to learn more about the Old Stone House. And it is a nonprofit. It relies on people like you coming through, saying how great that this space put on a book event 
gave us free beer, sold the book at a cheap rate, and let us enjoy a warm place to be on a cold night. So if you like that, learn more about the Old Stone House, thank him on your way out, become a member of the, of the Old Stone House. Does. And it's, it's a center of this community, in this playground, and in this neighborhood. So thank you to the Old Stone House, and thank you to the gate, which is the bar across the street that donated the beer that was given out for free. <laughs> so now we've got all these very non-commercial things going on, all these things that are not based on money, not based on concentration of power. But we're about to hear a little bit about the role that concentration of power has played over the last hundred years, as well as the forces in Congress and around the country that have tried to fight against it. And literally, as an impeachment is going on right now, uh, there are there are episodes in this book about impeachments of, of secretaries of uh, treasury. There are parts of this book that relate to every facet of what's going on in Congress and our political dialogue today. So I'm curious, how many of you have read the book already? Half. About half, great. Oh, we've already half of the book. <laughs> <laughs> I read half the book all the way through then. So, and, uh, and how many of you are going to buy the book tonight then? Great, okay, perfect. So, again, the book is for sale downstairs afterwards, and that will be available to sign. He's going to speak for a little bit, and then he and Zephyr are going to have a conversation about topics in the book and whatever else is on your mind. And with that, I want to welcome my dear friend to talk about his book, Goliath, Matt Silver. Um, thank you for having me, and thanks for coming out. So I'm going to talk about 15, 20 minutes uh, about impeachment impeachment of Andrew Mellon and how it relates to what's going on, I guess, today. Um, but first, I want, to, uh, I want to just tell you a story about wielding power, because I think it's really fun. It's a story, I don't think I put this in the book, but it's a story about Wright Patman, and it's about how he got the Federal Reserve to admit that it was a government institution, which I thought was really fun. So this is the Federal Reserve in DC. Uh, so the Federal Reserve is weird. It, it, it has 12 reserve, um, reserve banks that are quasi-governmental, quasi-not, but then the board is in D.C. and that sets policies for the, um, for the rest of the, of the Federal Reserve Bank. That's what sets interest rates. And for a long time, they wouldn't admit that they were part of the government because they didn't want to adhere to contracting laws or something like that. And so Wright Patman, who was on the banking committee and he hated how secretive the Fed was, said, you know, you have to obey these laws. And they were like, no, we're not part of the government. And so he said, okay. And he went to the D.C. city government and he said, this private institution has all of these buildings and they're not paying taxes on them. You should foreclose on those buildings. And so the D.C. city government initiated foreclosure proceedings <laughs> on the Federal Reserve's like, headquarters in D.C. And then they were like, oh, okay, we're part of government. So <laughs> that's just a story about wielding power, which, yeah, I don't need to tell you that because you, you watch the Democrats today and they're very good at wielding power. So I, I shouldn't have told you that story. Um, okay. I actually, I just got out of a, a very depressing conversation about the Onvis bill, which is why I told that story, because I feel like it's something pe someone needs to hear. So thanks for coming. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, all right, so Trump is being impeached. And typically when someone gets impeached at a high level, uh, it means there's something really, really wrong with our institutional order. So if you look around the economy today, you see a crisis of monopoly. And... Uh, I don't, you know, it's a big markets, search and social. Some of you guys are, are operating these markets, airlines, cable, but also small markets, uh, syringes, um, bank management software. One I'm going to do a, a newsletter piece on is, is um, a yoga studio software. That's really fun. An auto, auto, um, auto shop software. Uh, this is like one of the five rooms. This is, you're, like, you're like basically the only people I can be like, oh, there's this really fun story about yoga studio <laughs> software. So like, I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, uh, but, you know, it's a crisis, right? We're all being controlled by a small group of people. And I always use this quote because I think it really illustrates the problem that we're in right now, which is when Mark Zuckerberg said that Facebook is uh, more like a government than a business. What we're really doing is setting policies. And I think that kind of indicates the problem that we're having right now, which is that we're being governed uh, through private institutions. They're, they're operating as private governments. And they're unaccountable, and our public governments have, are, have deferred, are, are not wielding power, so that we can be ruled by private governments. So the concentration started in the 1970s, this, this roll-up, but it, it, it's so extreme now uh, that it's disillusioning all of us. It's also uh, corrupting our politics in profound ways. The good news is that we've been here before, um, and we have a choice before us. And that's, when I look at this impeachment, 
I don't look at it as, you know, was Donald Trump, you know, what did he do or what did he not do? Uh, I, I'm not following it that closely. I kind of feel like it's, it's like in order to understand what's going on, you have to like stream season one. <laughs> but like we kind of get the gist of it. Um, but the impeachment to me is a choice, right? Uh, it's not that we're going to remove Donald Trump from office. I, I say we either might be Republicans in this room. I have, you know, I, I like to, I have a lot of Republican friends. Um, it's because we both hate <laughs> Democrats so much. <laughs> we bond over that. Um, but uh, also, actually, there really is a conversation on the right that is as vibrant and interesting as there is on the left. Um, everywhere in society, people basically hate their boomers. Um, and and I, I say that as a joke, but it's actually true. And that conversation is real. A lot of people don't believe me, but it, it actually is happening. Um, but in terms of this uh, impeachment, you know, some people like Joe Biden says Trump is just ripping apart the soul of America, right? That for, for Joe Biden, Trump is the crisis, right? And that's one way to look at the impeachment, that, that Trump is a uniquely bad man. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a, there's, there, from the other side, um, uh, there's a belief that, that if, if Trump has done something corrupt, it's, it's no different than, you know, previous uh, office holders. So Hunter Biden had no business being on that, um, getting those retainers from that Ukrainian oil and gas company. Um, but uh, I don't really, it's, the, the specific claims are not that important because he's probably going to get impeached and then he'll be let off. But what is important is the following. Is this an impeachment of a single man? Is this an impeachment of Donald Trump for being a bad guy? Or is this an impeachment of a whole way of running society? A power structure that put this guy in office. And, and the answering that question determines the path forward because that's the critical question. So there are different theories about what to do. So if you accept Joe Biden's theory, and a lot of people who believe this, um, I think it's the animating theory behind MSNBC. Um, <laughs> all you have to do is, is go back before, by the way, thank you for laughing. That was like, that was like a little bit louder, a little bit weird, so I appreciate that. Because <laughs> I have like a loud laugh. Um, but uh, all you have to do is just get a, uh, get, a, get a different person in office, right? A Democrat or a moderate Republican, it doesn't really matter. If Trump is the crisis. Right. Um, now, from the other side, you could say, well, you know, if you're a Trump supporter, just keep Trump in office. Right. He's, he's the answer. Um, the, the other side of the of if you don't believe that, right, because I suspect most of you don't, then the argument is, is that um, Trump is just a symptom of a crisis that already existed. I think the simplest way to understand this is that lifespans are going down in America. I like that the flag like dramatically <laughs> waved. <laughs> you can't. You can't see this internet, but the flag just. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah, okay. There we go. All right. Yeah. Uh, so there's a lawlessness that I think is kind of everywhere at the top in our society. The laws are more kind of suggestions to powerful people than they are actual rules that they have to follow. The case that lawlessness and rancid inequality projected someone like Trump into office, we have to radically reorient our institutions. Another way to say it is that if uh, the last administration had prosecuted high level executives for their role in the financial crisis, Trump wouldn't have had a cabinet to hire. <laughs> <laughs> I like that these are jokes, but they're also true. <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to lay out a historical analogy. Uh, which, which can kind of give you a sense for what it might, might look like to not just impeach a man, but to impeach a whole way of doing business. So this is in, um, it's not Bill Clinton in 98, which, which happened in a time of prosperity, or Richard Nixon, uh, when, when it happened, in, his impeachment happened in a kind of heavily regulated and fairly stable financial system and economy. Uh, this, this is about Andrew Mellon. And since like, half of you are from my book, you know about the story already. Um, so I'm going to take you back to the 1920s. It was a technologically fantastic decade. Radio, that's when radio exploded. Um, cars, consumer culture. In 1920, Americans were coming out of 20 years of hope and change. They were attempting to deal with the emergence of this giant force, the corporation. 
So Teddy Roosevelt taking the presidency in 1901, and his great thing was that when there was this a giant coal strike, which was a huge deal, it was because everybody ran on coal. He didn't shoot the miners. Right? That was a new thing. Um, <laughs> and so people loved him. Um, there was a banker's panic in 1907, um, which was very similar to the financial crisis that we just experienced 10 years ago. The breakup of Standard Oil in 1911, the income tax, all the way to Woodrow Wilson, and then World War I. Right? It was reform idealism punctuated by catastrophic wars and financial crises. So Wilson comes in, he starts the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, uh, to tame monopolies, the Fed, to tame Wall Street. He breaks up AT&T. He breaks up the New Haven Railroad, which was kind of sort of the Uber of its day. And he finally starts taking on plutocrats. And then he takes his crusade global. So it's not just the domestic oligarchs and kings that he's taking on, but the actual kings and aristocrats in Europe. And he says, we're not going to allow uh, corruption to infect the, the globe. It's, we're we're going to actually bring the, the new freedom, which is what he called it, into the heart of the old world as well. But it ended in a catastrophe. And it wasn't just the violence of the World War. So from 1919 to 1921, there was a massive financial crisis. America experienced, according to the Federal Reserve, the greatest expansion of business ever known, um, which was a period of grotesque speculation. And the government tried to cut the euphoria, raising interest rates. This is one this is a Treasury official. If a panic in New York should break out, he would be glad of it. So they overshot, as they often do. Uh, commodities prices in May of 1920 started dropping at the fastest rate ever measured. Unemployment went from 4% to uh, 12% in less than a year. And industrial production dropped by nearly a quarter. Over 500 banks failed. And this wasn't like bank failures today where you wouldn't notice because your deposit, your account would be in a different bank the next, the next weekend. When a bank failed, your deposit, you know, all the depositors were screwed. So um, the Fed had tried to slow the economy, but it turned into a crash. If it sound, should sound familiar, because it's somewhat similar to what happened in 2008. Um, the Depression savaged the farm belt in particular. So cotton prices fell by 93%. Uh, this was the crime of 1920, as the Republicans called it. Uh, rural America went far to the right, and, that's, and the Republicans took everything over. So failed reform led to cynicism, and faith in democracy collapsed. So this is Haram Johnson, who was leading progressive he said, the people are docile and they will not recover from being so for many years. Uh, Walter Lippmann wrote a couple of books on how democracy couldn't work. Uh, progressive Herbert Crowley, who's the founder of the New Republic, he argued that the fascist route has its significant and even promising aspects, substituting movement for stagnation, purposeful behavior for drifting in visions of a great future for collective pettiness and discouragement. That's the New Republic. So they've always sort of been even the New Republic. Um, and, uh, and that was when fascism was sort of this new, newly, it was, it was before Hitler, it was, this was Mussolini. Um, but there was a basic lack of faith in democracy itself. So this is uh, the Christian century, they, they wrote, um, the hope of democracy will revive when it learns how to do the things that need to be done as efficiently as autocracy does them. So that's, that's pretty similar to what we hear about China. They can govern and we cannot. Um, so it was also really racist decade. Uh, and, and it got more racist. So this is a one politician. The dregs of Europe had orientalized, Europeanized, Africanized, and mongrelized America. Um, there was uh, the, the depression in the early 20s led to the rise of the second Ku Klux Klan, which was incidentally a for-profit multi-level marketing scheme that sold robes. Which <laughs> is true. Like, it's like the most hilariously uh, it's, yeah, that's amazing. It's like Amway of hate. Um, so, and then it collapsed, by the way, in a sex scandal in the late 20s. It's like, it's, I didn't, we didn't learn any of this in, in, in history, like, like class. It's, really, it's amazing stuff, but we didn't learn it. Um, so, so the early 20s, the Klan had four million members. Uh, the mayor of Portland, Oregon and Portland, Maine, by the way, I saw you nodding, being like, the Klan was more profit. Yeah. Well, yes, I, I, nodding, not in uh, Nodding that I think it's an important part of the history. Right. Yes, and the relationship to, to Amway and multi-level marketing gets us back to antitrust eventually. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see here. Texas, Alabama, Indiana sent Klansmen to the Senate. And um, this is when white mobs burned down Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. 
And so as democracy had failed to deliver and people reported, resorted to ethno-tribalism with symptoms of despair unaddressed by a callous government. Now, even though Democrats were in charge, the Democrats had shed their anti-monopoly populist traditions, so they nominated J.P. Morgan's lawyer as a presidential nominee in 1924. They fought mostly over social issues like prohibition and the KKK um, and supported debt forgiveness deals with European states that privileged Mussolini's government over those of democracies, right? So I know that will be really shocking to hear that the Democrats were really bad, but they were. So thank God we don't have to deal with that today. Um, so there were autocracies rising globally as they are now. Um, Portugal, Spain, Italy, Greece, Turkey, Russia, Poland, Czechoslovakia, and Belgium. This is when Hitler had his beer hall putsch in the early 20s. It's scary. It's like what we're seeing happening in China, in some ways Russia, in some ways what we're seeing in India, and um, I think Hungary, a couple of other places. Did you want to say something? No, I was giving you a five minute. Oh, okay. <laughs> So Mellon, uh, Mellon was like the private equity baron who ran uh, the government from 1921 to 1932. He was a critical part of the Republican coalition. He was picked as Treasury Secretary because uh, Warren Harding was like, oh, this guy's just really great with money, but he had lent $1.5 million to Harding's campaign in 1920. So that, that was helpful. Um, Mellon, this is one of his enemies, so Mellon needed a, ch a change and the Grand Old Party needed the cash. He also financed the campaign against the Treaty of Versailles. So he, he did a lot of things in office that were obviously corrupt. He ran his businesses from the Treasury. He got the FTC to stop investigating Alcoa, which was his company, and it was an aluminum monopoly. Uh, he owned many companies. Alcoa was just one of them. He passed tax cuts for the rich, um, and actually he got, he, he, he got, he commissioned this guy in the IRS to write a memo on how like the rich uh, took advantage of loopholes. He was like, we need to stop that. And so this guy wrote a memo being like, here's all the loopholes that rich people will use. And then, <laughs> then he was like, uh, you're hired to do my taxes. <laughs> and the guy kept his office in the, in the IRS, which is crazy. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, so uh, he also, if you ever go to, if you go to like that, I think it's like the FTC um, or some of the, some of the buildings in, in um, parts of, in, kind of the center of DC. There's a lot of aluminum used in the, in the um, like staircases. And, and it's, at one point, the treasury had this magazine for architects, which was really prestigious. And they started recommending the use of aluminum. <laughs> like all this penny anti crap that's like similar to the Trump hotel. Um, uh, he also used his office to get lucrative concessions from government contracts and extorting and manipulating foreign governments. The most important thing he did is he didn't govern in the face of the economic collapse from 1929 to 1932. This is where it doesn't um, necessarily cohere to, to where we are yet. yet. Um, so concentrated power and wealth in the 1920s led to this speculative froth and that crashed the unregulated banking system. And in 1932, there was a massive march of World War I veterans who wanted to get their pension paid a little early because they were poor. Um, this was called the bonus march for a variety of reasons. And Mellon was their main opponent because he's like, no, no, we have to get rid of the budget deficit and if there's any extra money, we need to cut taxes on the wealthy. So what happened is the, the, the guy who wanted, whose bill it was to pay out these veterans was Wright Patman. He had just been elected in 1928 and he filed articles of impeachment against Mellon and there was, um, there was sort of a, a protesters outside when he did that. Um, now, when he, uh, when he did this, people were like, oh, this is sort of a joke this guy from Texarkana, a really poor district. But then he spoke for about an hour and he laid out his terms. He had been a, a prosecutor, um, the ki a kind of like unfrozen caveman lawyer kind of guy. Like, I'm just a guy from Texarkana, but he's like a really good lawyer. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, the, and, uh, people took him really seriously after that. And then a week later, they, um, the Judiciary Committee actually held sort of a mock trial or an actual trial, I guess. And Patman embarrassed Mellon's expensive lawyers uh, at, at which point Hoover fired Mellon. Um, or at, you know, actually sent him to be ambassador to England, which everyone knew was a, was a firing. One voter wrote to Patman, England is too close, get him sent to China. Yeah. This is kind of funny because at the time China wasn't very important in England. <laughs> and Howard Kessler would be the opposite. So the joke doesn't really hit, <laughs> but, but in 1932 it would have killed. <laughs> okay, so, but the impeachment was not the end. Hoover didn't relent on the bonus bill and the old order, which had projected someone like Mellon remained in force. So what else did populists do? 
After the impeachment, there was a bitter fight within the Democratic Party that is similar to what is going on now. Um, one faction of the party was led by the social reformer Al Smith, who was on the payroll of the DuPonts. Smith thought that this was the chance for the Democrats. Everyone knew it was a big opportunity, but the question was the strategy. Right? Smith was like, this is our chance as Democrats to get big, big business to finance us mm -hmm. instead of the Republicans. Mm -hmm. um, and he was like, if we ignore the economy, repeal the antitrust laws, and run on prohibition, we're, we're in. Um, his main opponent was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, and, and Roosevelt wanted to run on the economy. And he had a bunch of allies, including Pat and Cordell Hall, who was a Tennessee senator. And he looked, and at the time, he was like, you know, there's fascists that are rising abroad. Because it's this interesting parallel where FDR is gaining power at the same time as Hitler is gaining power. And they're each watching each other. Um, when when uh, FDR was talking in 1932, he, he noted that there were um, mass movements of fascists abroad, but that Americans had not turned to violence. But he was like, that's not because we couldn't go fascist. He said, uh, the people had not turned to violence, but to fail to act is, he said, not only to betray their hopes, but to misunderstand their patience. Roosevelt narrowly won the nomination, and actually Hoover intervened to throw, secretly to throw the nomination to FDR because he thought he was the weakest candidate. Um, zoink. And then um, Hoover, in part, lost because he tear gassed the, the bonus army, right? He, and that, that was actually um, Douglas MacArthur ran that operation. Eisenhower was involved. Patton was involved. Like, yeah, they were heroes later. Um, that was kind of embarrassing for them. Uh, actually, MacArthur loved it, but Eisenhower was like, "This is they're just poor. Um, and um, anyway, so, so that wasn't enough, though. So the winning the primary, winning the election, getting rid of Andrew Mellon, um, Roosevelt immediately worked to embarrass the bankers who had caused the crash, which was men like Mellon. But, so into the election, right, 10 days before the election, and FDR worked with Ferdinand Pecora, who's working for the Senate, budget, or Senate Banking Committee. He was like, basically organized it so that the 10 days before he'd be inaugurated, they would just put Citibank uh, on trial so that the bankers would be just freaked out and they couldn't influence the, basically the transition. By the way, just a note, you guys have read the book, so there's a subtext to the book, which is that, that every financial crisis in America has to do with Citibank and Florida real estate. <laughs> um, it's like weird, I'm not, I'm not it's true. Um, uh, so, so he embarrassed, so Ferdinand Pecora embarrasses a bunch of these bankers, embarrasses J.P. Morgan, so I'm just gonna read you this um, quote. The problems raised by such an institution, talk about J.P. Morgan, go far beyond banking regulation in any narrow sense. It might be a formidable rival to government itself. Never before in the history of the United States had so much wealth and power been required to render a public accounting. So what he showed is a massive network of bribery. This was called the preferred list. And it was essentially how J.P. Morgan had essentially every major powerful actor in the country, from CEOs to Supreme Court justices to military leaders on his payroll. Right? And it was just straight, I mean, you know, it was straight bribery. And it was sort of this revelation of, of the people that really did run the country. So out of this came a whole bunch of laws, and I could read off a list. But the, the basic deal was, was that um, FDR and this populist group in Congress, and they fought, but, but the, what they effect fundamentally did is they seized power from financiers and they decentralized it to the people. So this is what the creation of the administrative state was about. So the, the Securities and Exchange Act, the, the, the Securities Act, Glass-Steagall, Air Mail Act, Public Utility Holding Company Act, robinson Patman, Secretary Mortgage Market, the Banking Act, the Civil and Arts Board, so on and so forth. Like, they put people on trial. Like, it wasn't that they were like, oh, it's time to centralize the government and have a bunch of unions. It was they were in a fight with the old order. And they said that. And they were trying to decentralize power through public governments. So basically from 32 to 38, the New Dealers destroyed the large financial holding companies that ran the economy, and they created a public governing apparatus and a new set of social and legal norms. So this is Walter Lippmann in 1937. He had written several books in the 20s saying, democracy doesn't work. This is on the death of John D. Rockefeller. Before Rockefeller started his enterprises, it was not possible to make so much money. Before he died, it had become the settled policy of this country that no man be permitted to make so much money. Sounds a lot like the question about whether billionaires should exist that we're talking about today. So it's not the 1920s. Um, it's not, uh, Donald Trump is not Andrew Mellon. But there are similarities. We're in a period of deep disillusionment and racism. Um, ten years off a financial crisis from which many of us never really recovered. 
and a war on terror that has lost its legitimacy if it ever had any. We have tens of millions of frustrated Americans, lots of different problems that they have, but one problem that's very common is student debt. And that's much like World War I veterans who felt they were promised something that wasn't delivered. Dictatorships all over the world are arising and liberal democracies are weakening. And there is substantial corruption within both parties who are very much tied politically to a concentrated business sector. So policies from the 1980s to the 2000s enabled the concentration of power, the financing and creation of institutions like, like uh, Fox News, CNN, MSNBC, Facebook, Google. And these institutions tear through the fabric of democracy. They replace actual news, actual community bonds with manipulated gibberish that's designed to sell ads and manipulate us. Lawlessness at the top is a fairly obvious problem. No one went to jail for the financial crisis. Big tech is constantly engaging in privacy violation or a random violation after violation and it doesn't matter. So the impeachment is an important moment because it is a moment when we can choose whether to indict Donald Trump for being just like a bad guy who we don't like, or it's the moment we can decide that our institutional order itself has frayed, that we the people must retake power and attack the institutions that put him there. So no one ever thought that Andrew Mellon was a good guy. He was a cold banker, a corrupt man, and everybody knew it throughout the 1920s, even as they worshiped him. But he stayed in power because Americans had lost their faith in democracy, in self-government. It's all just gangsters anyway. That's mm -hmm. how they thought about the world. It was a long road back to democracy and impeachment of Mellon was just the start. I think we're in not the same moment, but a similar moment. And the physical details, the technical realities, the culture, they're not identical. We're not in a depression. Um, but I think the principles, the values, the threat of concentrated power manipulating and controlling us these are the same, and we regained our liberties then. And the question is, can we do it again? Well, thank you for that. Um, a wonderful. Now you have the mic. <laughs> You've regained power. <laughs> Wait, should I give it? Oh. Can, no, can you hear me? You. Yeah. Oh, it's just for me? Yeah. This, oh, yeah. <laughs> That's very powerful. <laughs> this is kind of great. I don't think I've been in the same room with Justin and Matt since 2003 or four. <laughs> um, it's uh, wonderful uh, to be here. The Stone House is incredible. And um, Matt and I have been... Uh, talking, fighting, and, and uh, I certainly have been learning from him for the last 16 years. Um, and I think this book is a really incredible achievement, and I know a few of you have read it, but some of you are watching on the live stream and many of you haven't, and I really encourage you to read it. Um, before we get to, I, I have some history questions, um, but there's a few different ways that uh, I can understand the the worldview that you bring here. One is um, that, you know, there's corruption and apathy, and then there's the right way. And the other is that there are genuine ideological differences that are not necessarily driven by corruption, but just genuine different beliefs about the way economy and democracy should work. And um, that the Democratic Party is in a fight about within those genuine differences. And, and, or there's a cross-section of those. And I, I, I hear both in your writing and as you speak, seeds of both of those. And how would you, how, how would you um, pull those apart? You're so smart. That's <laughs> <laughs> not, not a compliment. That's the hard question to answer. <laughs> yes. It's like, oh. <laughs> you uh, thought a lot about this. Yeah. So. Uh, not enough, though, to make it coherent. <laughs> no. uh, I, um, I, I think that it, it, when you think about corruption, right, and you, you talk about this, um, in your, your book is amazing on corruption. It's, it's um, it, you know, I, if you haven't read uh, corrupt, Corruption in America, it's, it's terrific. Um, 
I look at corruption and I think that it's bad, but also that it represents um, a system of governance. So um, it's a system, like when you, when you talk about a lobbyist, well, like what is a lobbyist, right? In political science parlance, they call lobbyists le a legislative subsidy. Because if you've ever worked with a lobbyist before, what they do is they're just like extra staff. Mm -hmm. And they do staff work, right? And they just make your, your job easier. So uh, I worked, I didn't do very many sleazy things when I worked in Congress, but one thing I did do was I helped get a loophole in Dodd-Frank for the timeshare industry, which is like the sleaziest industry in the world. <laughs> um, but, I, but the guy was and, and for those of you who don't know, who were you working for? I was working for a guy named Alan Grayson who was um, representing Orlando. There's a lot of timeshare businesses down there, and so he was trying to help the local terrible industry. And they, they hated him anyway, so I don't recommend it. Um, but, uh, but it was so easy, right? Because the, the, they, they knew, I was like, they, they were like, here's the text of the amendment, here's what everybody thinks, here's what the chairman's gonna say, here's what the, what's happening in the other house. And, uh, and it was just, it was super easy. You didn't have to do any work. And it was like working in a, in a really functional, high-performing organization. And when you wanted to do work to like, go after you know, corruption at the Fed or, or, or when you wanted to like, make the government do something that was useful. It's, it was just a lot of work and you were understaffed. And so it's, uh, it's, it, it was bad that we were understaffed in important kind of social areas and it was, it was a problem that we, we couldn't deliver social equity. But it was also a system of governance that, uh, that meant that government was working for those, that, our, our, that government was working for them. And, and now it's so extreme I think that you, you're not even in a situation where government is working for the um, concentrated capital. I think concentrated capital is governing directly. That's mm -hmm. like what, when I think Zuckerberg today, you know, they were like, Instagram influencers only are not allowed to push vaping products or various other things. And it's like, that's, that's who's governing, right? I mean, the, the, the Facebook election commission is handling our electoral discourse, right? So, so when you think about, and this is how I think about economics as well, it's like economists are not necessarily corrupt. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. What I would say is good or bad. But it, it's, it, they're designed to burrow into the bureaucracies and govern in place of the public. Right? So that, that's how I think about it. And I use the rhetoric of corruption because it's a very luscious, rich rhetoric that people kind of get excited about. Whereas saying, well, this, isn't, this, is, just a, this is a different system. But I do think that, that, that it's more of a different system than it is. But, so, so then this gets to my question about, you did a nice setup for us for uh, the uh, New Deal and some of what the New Deal brought. But I want you to then talk about the um, 70s and the Clinton era. And let's just talk about the Democratic Party. Um, and what, when the Democratic Party chose to um, no longer fight monopolization and financialization. Um, either, I mean, part of what I'm asking is, um, why, aren't, why shouldn't I just hear you as being a, a Marxist determinist in this sense? <laughs> when, yes. the Democratic, when the Democratic Party chose this path, and it was a choice, and right. you describe it as a choice, was it a choice driven by what you think is a wrong ideology? Or was it a choice that was necessary because of fundraising? That, it's another hard question. <laughs> I don't like this. <laughs> I'm not the Marxist. You're the Marxist. <laughs> um, uh, I don't. I, well, don't I, only well, care, well, well, I only care if I think the joke is funny. So. Okay. Um, uh, no, the, but, but it was the, an ideological the, choice. Okay, okay, and that's what I'm trying to get right. at because I, 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 I believe that you believe. <laughs> in the power of ideas and do right. not believe that even if we are up against some systems that are really hard to get around, including the systems of lobbying um, or the way our campaigns are currently funded, that you don't think we're stuck. No. And, so, and so if we're not stuck and if we weren't stuck in the 70s, um, what was the alternate belief that led us down the wrong path? Okay, so, so what happened... And yeah, you can do, do a little history. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so, so what happened is that there were a bunch of Democrats in the, in the 70s who were incredibly confused because they, they were disillusioned from the Vietnam War, they were disillusioned from a whole series of bad uh, 
of, of bad policy choices. But they had also grown up on um, John Kenneth Galbraith's writing and, and Richard Hofstadter's writing, and, uh, and this, and C. Wright Mills, just a series of scholars who had, who had painted this very sophisticated alternative vision of what America was. And this vision of America was one, so before the, the 1950s, the basic story that you were taught, the basic history you were taught was Hamilton versus Jefferson, right? Hamilton was the plutocrat, Jefferson was the Democrat. Um, and there were a lot of problems with this narrative, but this is the narrative that you were, that you kind of understood, and you understood in the Anglo-American tradition, and it was an Anglo-American tradition, it went back, you went back to the 1600s. You, you were taught about fights against aristocracy, fights against monarchy, fights against um, plutocracy, and they were all the same fights. Um, you were taught that the farmers in the 1880s and 1890s were, were, were dealing with oppressive, coercive railroads and bankers, and then we figured it out, progressives sort of figured it out. What happened in the 50s and 60s is that Galbraith and, um, and Hofstetter argued, this isn't what actually happened. What happened is those farmers, uh, America had always been capitalist. There really had never been any ideological debates in America. And those farmers were really just, they were Anglo-Saxons who were worried about status anxiety. That was a very, very big thing for Hofstetter. He liked to talk about status anxiety. And all the, the fear of the railroad barons or the, or the money trust was kind of like, that was just, you know, a good way to like market your status anxiety, but it wasn't real. Um, those, they were a little boorish. Like Galbraith was like, yeah, they smoked too many cigars. They were boorish, but they weren't, it was like, there was a natural evolution to the corporation. And so when, they were also taught something called affluence, which is really important. So this concept of affluence, which came out in 19, book, 1958, a book by Galbraith, the Affluence Society came out and it was, it was a bestseller. A lot of Galbraith's books were on the shelves. If you walk into a college student's um, room in, in the 1950s or 60s, you'd see Galbraith, Galbraith's books, 1970s as well. Affluence, the, the, the concept of affluence was that America was just this incredibly wealthy economy, right? That it just produces an endless number of goods and services and, um, and jobs. And in the 1970s, one of the Car Carter official was like, we're going to have this problem. I think we should lower the retirement age to this. This is Juanita Krebs, who is the, the Secretary of Labor. She's like, we're we should lower the retirement age to 35, right? It was, like, it was like that crazy, right? I mean, she didn't say this when she was Secretary of Labor. She said this earlier. But it was like that was the thing. And that was not weird to say that. This was the concept of affluence. It was a very profound, um, it was a very profound capture. And it said that, that political economy was not part of politics. Business and banking power was not part of politics. Galbraith said, we were always dealing with the politics of scarcity the politics of production, that is over. We've figured it out. Now we have to think about the politics of consumption. How do we distribute this wonderful bounty? So that created the consumer rights movement in the 1970s. Well, all of a sudden, starting in like 1970 with the bankruptcy of the Penn Central, but then moving into a series of, 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 of um, financial crises, which, which have to do with earlier uh, deregulatory moves in the 1950s and 60s, you start to see like a collapse of our political economy, productive capacity. And then the liberals have no, they, have, they don't understand it because they've been taught their whole lives that we've figured out production. And also they've been taught that, that we're affluent and that, that pro, anyone talking about production is just, it's just a status anxiety thing. Or they're taught um, that it's not part of politics. It might be sad, but it's, not, it's nothing that policy so, 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 that, that's so, we, so that then most of politics is about the scope of redistribution. Yeah. So, okay. so right. as opposed to the sh the shape of production, is that? Yeah. So, okay. so, so the the politics becomes about narrow narrower cultural issues, which are which are important, but but questions of corporate and banking power don't intersect with those. And then you can you can do some taxing and redistribution. You can talk about socialism, right? Mm -hmm. That's something that Galbraith talked about. He said he was a socialist. One of the things I noticed is they were super confused, the Democrats, in the 1970s. And in the late 1970s, they, the language they used started changing. So they started saying, not people and bridges, but human capital and, uh, and infrastructure and public-private mm -hmm. partnerships and sort of weird techno language, like flabby techno language, like DLC mm -hmm. type stuff. And that started then. And then, like, in 1983, 1984, wait, wait, so I just want to walk through that. That's uh, people versus human capital and bridges versus infrastructure. Right. That's really interesting. I remember a class in uh, one of my classes in college that was talking about the history of the English language and how the uh, like French 
uh, Latin and German all had different roots, and the Germans had been the peasants, so mm -hmm. that um, political language that refer used a French or Latin antecedents was more likely to appeal to elites. <laughs> so that was really interesting, like, um, you know, sheep, mutton, that, that's a bad example. But <laughs> Nobody talks about mutton. <laughs> A bridge and infrastructure is interesting, right? Because I use infrastructure all the time, but you're right. It's a fancy, weird word. Right, right. right. Yeah. Um, I'm older and I use bridges and tunnels. Yeah, bridges and tunnels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, no, it's so like our language is marbled yeah. with this stuff. And, but so basically people got really confused and they started to deregulate in 1975. That was really when it started. Um, and but this is very confusing for us to think about Carter. Well, this is before Carter. Right, okay, so it's not 76. This is 75. 75. Uh, yeah, like, the, this yeah. is, they got rid of Patman in 75, yeah. so they get rid of him. And then, um, and then they, the first thing they do is they get rid of um, fair trade laws, mm -hmm. which are these, yeah. these laws that basically prevent chain stores. Because they're like, we like chain stores. That lowers <laughs> consumer prices. And these are, this is the consumer rights movement. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, we're totally cool. We don't want any form of discrimination, but you can, you can discriminate on, on economic size. That's the one form of economic discrimination that's totally fine. Um, and uh, and that, that was like small business lobbyists were like, who were Democrats, who were like, what are you doing? This is crazy. And what I noticed is that they were genuinely like confused and, and trying to figure out what to do. But I guess about eight years later, and this answer, this is to get to your point about corruption, like the financing, 83, 84, 85, that's when like a bunch of these people just ended up on Michael Milken's payroll, mm -hmm. right? So then it was just kind of like, I'm confused and now I'm rich, right? Mm -hmm. And that was like a, sw a switch that happened in the, in the early to mid 80s. And then it got much, much, much worse in the Clinton administration. Mm -hmm. And Clinton, I think there really is this a nihilism there, like a cynicism. The guy just looted, he just looted. And you know, part of it was like, he was a little bit confused, but man, that, I mean, I, the more I look into the Clinton administration, it just, it just looks like this, this, this total cesspool of, of pay to play. And I, I'm like, I, I like to, you know, you guys know, I, I sometimes I'm not always charitable to the Obama administration. Um, <laughs> but, but there's like this, interestingly, when you talk to people who are like a little but, bit older mm -hmm. than who like lived through the Clinton administration and were on the outs, it's just like there's a, there's a so, so, shocked so you see to it. the seven Democrats in the 70s as influenced by too much of the consumer rights yeah. movement and a focus on the consumer, and then you see Clintonism as non ideological fundamentally. Is that? Well, I think it just was, it was the same ideology, but it was just way more cynical. Okay. It was just kind of like, fuck it, we're going to get rich. Okay. You know? I mean, I don't think they were trying to get rich in the 70s. I, I think they were, they were genuinely like, you know, no, in 1975 when they, when they were, they weren't on the payroll of Walmart because they didn't even probably know what Walmart was. But like, by, but, they, but Bill Clinton did, right? Because it was an Arkansas company. And his wife so I'll ask, I'll ask the consumer rights question. Right. And are you saying that toothpaste is going to cost more and we should accept that? Lots <laughs> <laughs> I mean... It probably won't. Like if you look at costs in more um, competitive markets, they're usually lower. But um, but that like I don't I wouldn't make the pitch. Oh, things will cost lower if you do the things that I want. I would say no, that, no, no. But I'm asking, would you make the pitch the opposite pitch, which is to say some things are going to cost more, and that's. I mean, the, the power of the consumer rights movement, you can talk about it abstractly, but when you actually have the rubber hit the road, it can be hard to engage with because the power of saying, do you really want to have people pay more for basic goods? Um, or, or if you take away consumer price as the key way to analyze so much of what's happening in our well, I, I think the way I'd say it is like, well, look, they, they, um, uh, you're not going to be paying... I mean, there's, there's a number of ways to say it. It depends on the market. It t depends on the good, right? Because it's like, are you going to take away my cheap Comcast? Like, I don't think people are like, oh, yeah, I'm getting great value for that. Right. But like, um, so, so it kind of depends. And the real answer is yeah. you, they'll, they'll charge you uh, more when they can, right? You're, you're going to get things cheap when they don't have power over you and while they're gaining power over you. But once they have power over you, then they're mm -hmm. going to gouge you, mm -hmm. right? So the, ultimately, if you sell your liberty, right, for, for something, you know, for a low price, you will, you will not get that low price forever, but also, more importantly, you won't be free. And mm -hmm. I think that's what's happened. Yeah. We've sold our liberty. Um, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. 
So um, I'm going to open it up in just a second. Um, I have two questions. They're both big. So I, I, I want to figure out a short way to like, give, get you to preview them. Um, I guess I just first want to ask about race and anti-monopolism. Because you talk about Wilson, who famously is a, you know, a virulent segregationist. And um, there are, of course, uh, fantastic um, uh, uh, anti-monopolists who are also abolitionists. So I, I want to actually recognize the complications of history, but look at today for a second when you think about anti-monopoly and race. Um, and, and their intersection. How do you think about it? So I think that like, anti-monopolism is, you know, the basic problem with when you're talking about business and race is that um, like, the black community doesn't have any money, right? It's a capital access issue. So uh, it goes back to the 40 acres and a mule problem, right? So you can open up markets, but you don't, um, you know, if you don't have any money, you can't compete in those markets. And the more, if the social networks in which you operate, if there's no money there, you can't, you, like, you can't compete, right? And so this is what we've seen. So I'm, I'm doing an, on a, a study on Comcast, because Comcast mm -hmm. is in a fight with a bunch of, of uh, so, so there's a, there is a, a wealthy network of black business people in entertainment, mm -hmm. right? Because that's one of the few areas where black uh, business people were able to compete. Um, on a level playing field, and so there is a network there. Uh, so if you look at like the five or six black billionaires, uh, three or four of them are come from entertainment or sports. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and, and there were a lot of, you saw that the first industry that was created after the civil rights movement, the first media industry was cable. So cable was largely 1970s, 1980s industry, and it was also done on a municipal level. So there were municipal franchises. So where you had cities with a lot of black voters, with black uh, influence power structures, you often had black business people who were able to gain cable franchises. But often they didn't have the money to build out to wire the, the cable franchises. So they ended up either not being able to install the cable systems or just selling out. Mm -hmm. And so you saw this, this, uh, this consolidation of power. And some, some black business people got rich, but Mostly it was just a, a roll-up of power, because it, it also coincided with the law and economics movement in the 1980s. And we never really, um, the, the lack of capital in the black community has a, a very toxic, especially in an era of monopolies, has a very toxic impact in that um, if you have no money, then the, the, the corruption that, you, um, that works in, in communities that have capital works especially well in communities that have no capital, right? So if you can't raise money, if you need $100,000 to run a campaign mm -hmm. and, you ha and you're in a poor black community, you're not going to be able to find the money as easily as you could in a wealthier community, mm -hmm. right? So who's going to give you that money? The, that $2,000 check from Comcast is going to be worth a lot more to that black policymaker than it would be to a white policymaker who's coming from a wealthier area. So. Um, it's just inherently easier to corrupt a community and the political structure of a community where there is no capital. And this is something that's been just really hard to deal with. And it's, it's something I've changed my mind about in the last six months or so. Which I thought opening up markets was really the key to uh, kind of having a more racially egalitarian society. But I actually am coming to believe that access to the market is, is obviously super important. But, but capital access... Is, is just as important. And it's something that we have, and I think like some of us work in like the anti-monopoly movement, we haven't done a very good job but thinking capital. through how, the, yeah, how, to, how to do that. I mean, it's no surprise that franchisees are disproportionately represented um, by uh, franchisees of color because it's where you don't need as much capital startup. Right. And then they're totally abused by the franchisors right. who use that position of power. So in, in Two sentences, and then we're going to open it up to questions. Three. Can you describe, you know, after this great, everybody's read your book, and I know that many people on the Hill are reading it, which is very exciting. Um, and I hope lots of people in the New York State Legislature are reading it, too. Um, that, like, what does the world look like in 30 years? Um, can you describe... Uh, a political economy that looks healthy. In, in three senses. Yeah, that's all. 
<laughs> that's, that's just mean. Yeah, yeah. No, that's mean. Yeah. Or, or just give us, give us some hints. I think there just, you just be a lot less fear. Mm. I think a lot of people, I think everybody is operating mm -hmm. in this, with this just tremendous fear. The stakes of, of going, of misstepping are so high. And it, it you know, it, you, can, you can be wealthy and empowered and it's, you're still afraid, right? Not as necessarily afraid as you mm -hmm. are if you're poor, but the less power you have, the worse off it is. But this is a very fearful society and yeah. we, we shouldn't be afraid all the time. Yeah, it's something that Montesquieu thought is that uh, signs of fear in a society were the early warning signs of tyranny. So I'm sure there are uh, questions <laughs> or uh, comments. I see some uh, old friends and people I don't know. Uh, the gentleman with the uh, collared shirt. Yeah. Hey, uh, thanks for building your talk. Do you want to share? I can, I can project. Is that okay? Is that fun? Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, so thanks for coming to talk. I actually have one question, but after this discussion, I have two if you allow me. The first one is, um, actually, so last night I finished the chapter of Populist State Power, really cool chapter, and that's where I got my first record from, which is basically, you know, you read that chapter, and you realize all that was done in the first four years of when FDR came to power, and the populists took power. Um, and I think if you asked, if you go back to history, you would ask them, you know, like, how did you get so much done, or why were you focused on so many things, I think they would say, you know, we had this crisis on our hands from the Depression, and it really required a massive reorganization of the economy. And so I know former Obama officials that would probably, if you ask them why so little was done in the first four years of their administration, they would say, we had this crisis, we could only focus on saving the banks and saving the financial system. So you know, because so little was done in those first four years of the Obama administration in terms of reorganization of the way economic power is managed and distributed, I kind of feel like we kind of missed the boat. And now, you know, the right and now has an opportunity to wield power, as you said, right? How do you see that playing out? How do you see that, that parallel? Uh, uh, I'll come, come back, back to your second question, question after we've yeah, distributed sure. power that around the awesome realm. Awesome it's a great, it's, yeah. I think that's really cool, by the way. <laughs> I didn't know that the idea, I had not thought about, it. oh, well, we, we had a crisis, we had to fix so much, versus we had a crisis we could only focus on. Mm. That's so interesting. Again, I, it's because I know Obama officials from I, and, you know, I didn't work in the, in the administration, but I do speak with people, and at any time I'm like, you know, it was a clear decision to take to save the banks and not much attention to pay to homeowners and mortgage holders, right? And if you ask them, like, why, why was such little attention paid, they're like, look, we only had, we were, we may have been myopic in our approach, but it was because it was a crisis that we needed to solve. Yeah. So, 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 so that there was there, Emanuel Seller, I don't have this quote on me, but, but so I'm going to paraphrase it. So Emanuel Seller, who is in, uh, Nava represents his district now, but he was this uh, amazing um, member of Congress from, I guess, the t early 20s until the 1972. And he talked about what it was like. And he was like, basically, you couldn't really do much. The 1920s was sort of boring and weird and racist. And, uh, and then the depression hit and, and everybody was freaked out and we did a few things like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, we did some investigations. But he talks about what it was like when Roosevelt came in and he, was, he says, it was like magic, right? The, all of a sudden, you know, DC was full of sort of young, excited men who wanted to do things that mattered. And I think it's like, even the committee reports took on the, the the brisk tone of authority, I think is what he said. But it was just like, all of a sudden, everything seemed to matter. And I think that's like, and he's like, I don't know why. He, he like thinks maybe it was sort of FDR, maybe it was, but it, there was a, but there was a, a sense of leadership and a, and a sense of, of consensus that big things needed to happen. And so everybody just kind of acted and, and did things. It was an amazing quote. I, I don't know. I mean, I worked in, in Congress in 2009 and 10, and it was just miserable. I mean, it was just miserable because everything you did, it was just like leadership would, um, they would uh, process <laughs> troll you to death, right? Well, I want to do this. Oh, have you gotten permission from these 10 people? Oh, and then, you know, oh, I want to do that. You know, it was just like this. They, they clearly had things they wanted to do, and they just wanted everybody else to shut up and go away. And it was just a very different, I, I just don't, I wouldn't use that same, I wouldn't characterize it the way Emmanuel Seller did. 
And I'm not sure where that came from because, you know, it was partially, it was FDR, but also like, you know, in 1936, the Democrats passed the bonus bill over FDR's veto, right? Like there were people fighting FDR, like Huey Long was mm -hmm. fighting FDR. Like there was, the populace didn't always trust FDR. So there were big fights within the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. And there were lots of different leaders within the Democratic Party. And it, it wasn't just, it was, it was, a, it was like a, it, there was a big social movement, but it, was, but it was a social movement of people that knew parliamentary procedure and then paid attention to business. I will say there's a very exciting uh, action happening right now in the House Judiciary Committee, and we should be supporting it. And Nadler is a, a fan of Seller. But then you, you're talking about the antitrust. Oh, right? yes, because right, not, yes. Not the, yes, David, David Cicilline's um, antitrust subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee is very active, has amazing Congress members on it. Jayapal, Joe Naguzzi, um, it's the, it's the and first Cicilline, Raskin. I mean, it's incredible. And they sent out a, a list of questionnaires to big tech um, that was awesome. <laughs> And um, you know, I'm I'm sort of hoping that Congress really gets to understand its um, not its subpoena power, and its contempt power. <laughs> it's just ability to know things, right? Yeah. So they're actually doing what they did in the 1930s. But just to give you an example of how different it is today, I mean, I think it's totally crazy that the CEO of Boeing is still the CEO of Boeing. Mm -hmm. I think it's totally insane. But I also think it's crazy that we have lost the ability to make safe civilian airplanes in this country. And we really have lost the ability. It's not something that you can just fix with a policy. You have to regain that ability. It's going to take years. And it's so crazy that DeFazio, who's the who's running the investigation, is, is first of all, I doubt any most people know he's running an investigation. Mm -hmm. I don't, because it doesn't seem like there's anything happening. But this is just a national treasure, Boeing, right? The ability to fly. And we've tossed it away, and nobody's paying attention to it. And it's crazy, and I don't understand why. And there are political reasons to care about it, because a lot of Boeing workers are in South Carolina, and that seems to be a politically important state. I mean, there's no reason for this. It doesn't make any sense, except Democrats just don't pay attention to business. They just don't, or national security, or military things, because it's also a huge defense contractor. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, people think, oh, you're kind of like spicy on Twitter, but I'm like, have you, like, this is crazy, right? This is really weird, like, pay attention. And I, I don't know where that, like, in the 20s, this is the other thing that happened, is they, they really did actually pay attention to this stuff. They just were kind of despondent because there wasn't that much that they could do. But, like, you know, but, it's coming but, back. But, That's but, why but, yes, what Cicilline is doing is so important. What Cicilline is doing is important, and um, there's consistent understanding that as an essential part of Congress's power to legislate is Congress's power to investigate. Yeah. Um, and the power to investigate is extremely broad. So when Boeing... Um, has been killing people and grounded, the capacity to subpoena and bring people to come testify is very large. I want to ask the gentleman with a, with a sweater back there. But just to say, the New York Times doesn't have subpoena power, and they seem to be getting a lot of stories done. Right? Mm -hmm. So you don't, yeah, like, this is, this is a, it's a willpower thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is a big shift. Uh, I want to talk about your blog post recently about Disney. Um, and my question, in a little bit of context, anti-competitive murders aside, because I'm with you there, should producers really be prevented from controlling the distribution of their content? And uh, for example, in music, right now, administrative law judges sitting in the copyright office are setting streaming rates via these hearings, and they compare versus free market uh, examples that don't actually exist in many cases. Uh, is that better, you know, forcing these musicians and these producers to license their content? whereas Disney is not. Um, and this was the result of the Music Modernization Act. There was some radio precedent. And then consider Tesla. So Tesla's trying to disintermediate dealers. Uh, do you think Tesla should be prevented from doing this? I mean, dealers increase the cost of your car sold by a pretty substantial margin. And there are a variety of brands that other consumers could buy. The same with Disney. Other people make movies. Um, that is my question. Is this, is this really the right direction uh, to regulate the, the film and the entertainment industry? Uh, so I don't know about music because I haven't studied. You know, that would require really looking into the BMI ASCAP and the music modernization. And, you know, so I'm not going to speak to that. Um, but I do think that uh, if you are using 
your uh, copyright, your copyrighted material. Like copyright is a is a monopoly grant, right? And if you're using that monopoly grant to make money from your uh, from your art, great, go ahead and do that. If you're using your monopoly grant to leverage that into another into market power, which is aka distribution market power, that's a problem. And it doesn't mean you can't distribute your content. Like if I, you know, we're distributing the content right now, but this is, I'm not going to have any market power from, from distributing this content. Whereas Disney, it's very explicit that what they're doing with their roll up of a whole bunch of, of IP, branded IP, is they are leveraging that into a, a powerful distribution channel that is designed to have market power and to exclude others. And they're also using their IP to gain control of, of, uh, of theater chains and independent theaters uh, de facto. So I think that, that that's a, that when, what you're really talking about is, is a question of, of using IP to gain market power. I don't know about music, because again, I haven't studied it. I, I, I suspect you'd, you'd find a whole bunch of places where it's fine, and you'd find a whole bunch of places probably like you know, Live Nation, where, where you do have distribution problems. But the basic problem with Disney and with Netflix and uh, some of these, these uh, companies is that they aren't allowing the creator of, these, uh, of this, this content to, to direct, to send this information to their audience, the content to the audience. If I'm a creator and I try to send my stuff through Netflix, I have to get their permission, which is fine. But they don't necessarily give me data. I don't necessarily own the data. I don't necessarily have the ability to communicate with the audience. I don't have the ability, if somebody likes my work, to put my, my content in front of them. Netflix has that power. And the same thing is true with Disney. So what, when you're talking about, like our laws should be structured to allow creators to, to interface with audiences broadly. And, and I think our laws are, are, and, our, and our systems are, are increasingly designed to help financiers gain market power over those distribution channels. Uh, Deborah. OK. Um, so I'm going to go back to the mid-70s. I was actually a grown-up back then. Um, and I, I, will, I will have a slight, I understand what you're saying about consumer, consumers becoming important. But I was, you know, back then I was a radical. I marched in the streets. I thought the revolution was around the corner. And um, I saw Jimmy Carter and, and, being, and that movement as being influenced not by consumer finance issues, but by Republican ideology about deregulation. And so I railed against what they were doing with trucking, and I railed against what they were doing with um, airlines, and of course, everybody else thought I was crazy. <laughs> um, and I think that some of the dangers <coughs> Uh, of those kinds of changes actually come from Republican ideology about um, having, um, what would you call it, less government interference in everything. Okay, and so anti-monopoly anti is government interference by definition. And I think the danger now, and I, 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 I didn't vote for Jimmy Carter, I think I voted for Gus Hall, because he was so conservative, I thought, and I just refused to accept any of the changes that he made in terms of the regulation. And I thought they were dangerous, and they turned out to be dangerous. And Ronald Reagan did that even more. But I think the danger now, because I know that you feel that it's important that this is a bipartisan issue, is it's not so much the analysis of the problem that the Republicans may be having about the issue of monopoly, it's potential solutions. They will not be the same solutions. They will be solutions that seem to actually privilege some people much more than other people. And I will say I came for, to this from the reproductive rights movement, where you know I constantly they were telling us to understand the other side, and I was refusing to understand the other side because I didn't give a shit about the other side um, and their attitude because they because it was not reciprocal. You know, when they said safe, legal, and rare, what they turned rare into is there should be no abortions, <coughs> not that there should be um, no unwanted pregnancies. And I think the danger you have to watch when this thing what plays out is the kinds of solutions that Republicans and right-wingers will come up with. They won't be the same solutions, and they will privilege, they will privilege 
richer people, they will not privilege poorer people. It will look, it will not necessarily look that obvious at first, but they will because they too have tribal affinities, and we all have tribal affinities. And so I think that's why, why I was bringing up the fact that Jimmy Carter, to me, was the beginning of the Republicanization of the Democratic Party, which mm. carried all the way through Bill Clinton and Barack Obama. So this is such a great book talk because we have a lot of people who are deep in the book of Stoller and are coming to not just ask questions but to engage in spirited debate. I think so. you're in the acknowledgments. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So do you want to? Well, I mean, it, that was just a good comment. So we yes. Can, I mean, yeah. <laughs> yes. It was a great comment. Uh, gentleman in the back. Yes. Okay. So man, I actually heard you on. Uh, on NPR a few weeks ago uh, talking about uh, Bill Gates. Uh, you know, Bill Gates on, on the media? A great philanthropist yeah. who uh, played real hardball to become a monopoly, and that's how he became a billionaire. And now he pays billions, he's giving them away philanthropically and in a wonderful uh, humanistic way. Um, Ish. And <laughs> the, the issue is that basically what so many people like him are doing um, is taking advantage of the laws. And I say taking advantage of, not in the sense of evil, uh, you know, but in, more in the sense of how one defines monopolistic behavior, and that's a whole realm of law. And you know, the government tried to uh, go after Microsoft, and it failed. And, and you know, and that's how our system works. Uh, the, the, uh, and you know, and there are many other areas of the law today which are basically very weak. Uh, maybe because there aren't enough uh, socialist lobbyists running around to do the work of the understaffed offices to have very, very good legislation. So, and we have to work in the world that the hand has dealt with, the world as it is not as we wish it were. So I just like it. It's, it's, a, it's a great comment. And so I have a question sort of coming off that comment. One of the things that I ran into in 2009 around Dodd-Frank was antitrust lawyers saying, oh, what you're talking about is interesting, but it's not antitrust. Mm -hmm. Because it was defined by the scope of how law, how courts were currently defining it. So how would you define say, monopoly, and do you think that's different than the way the law defines it, and, and should there be two different definitions? Um, so I'll play fake lawyer. So first I want to make a quick correction, yeah. because this is something Bill Gates says, and he was lying. Microsoft lost. Okay, so, so they overturned the remedy, the remedy of breaking up the company. They did lose, and, then, and when the remedy was overturned, it's not like they said, oh, we don't find you guilty anymore. They said, you're guilty. We're just not going to break you up. So to be clear, they were found guilty of monopolization, and that was not overturned. Um, I guess the it question just annoys is, is me it, that Bill Gates yeah. lies about that today. Yeah. yeah. It, it really, I mean, it's, yeah. it's, it's just it's profoundly dishonest. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but, but I think you could definitely make the argument that the government failed. I wouldn't make that argument. But I think it's fair to say the government failed. I just don't think, I don't think it's totally accurate. But they were found guilty, and that was not overturned. Um, so maybe let's, I'll ask an even sort of more mundane version of this, is that I think people are sometimes intimidated by the fact that there are interpretations they may not, in, and I don't think the gentleman in the back is included here, but um, intimidated by, like, I can't use the word monopoly because it means something to lawyers, and therefore I, I have to wait until I know what that right. means. Right, well, so, yeah. so monopolization is really complicated because, you know, so uh, what, what's often happening is, is that so, a product or a company can be a monopoly to some people but not others. So, you know, you, you can maybe, like if you want to buy a phone, you can buy a, a Google, an Android phone, or you can buy an Apple phone. So it doesn't look like a monopolized market. I mean, it's just two products, right? So it's, there's, it's very concentrated, but it's not a monopoly. However, if you're an app maker, right, and a lot of your customers are, are, use, use Apple phones, Apple is a monopoly to you, because to get to your customers, you have to go through the Apple App Store. 
And Google is a monopoly to you. It's two separate monopolies, whereas to a consumer, it's actually two competitive like substitutes. But they're not actually substitutes when you're on the producer side. So I think monopolization is complicated because industry structures are complicated. But the idea of having um, market power, dominant market power, you know, you can have dominant market power in lots of different ways in these industries. I, I think that, um, so in, in terms of defining these terms in the law, I mean, the law around monopolization is ridiculous because it, it's something called the rule of reason, most of it is, which says that something's not illegal unless a, a judge finds it unreasonable, right? That's the gist of it. I mean, it, I'm, I'm simplifying a little bit, but that's a crazy way to do law. It's like Schrodinger's law, right? Because you're like, is that illegal? I don't know. Maybe let's bring it to a court, spend $5 million, and then we'll open the box and we'll learn it's illegal or not. So it's ridiculous. Like, that's a really big problem. And one of the things that Robert Bork wanted to do is to make more things subject to the rule of reason because he wanted less clarity around the law so that everybody could always say, oh, well, we're not sure. You're, you're too dumb to know. Um, so I do think there should be a lot more just bright line rules, right? I think that we should have a lot more stop signs and a lot less weird rule of reason I, micromanagement. I, I was asking something, about, but do you think people should hesitate before using the word monopoly? Or do you think it has a political, like in corruption, which is what I study, there's a right. political meaning and then there's legal meanings and they overlap, but it's okay to use the word corrupt without checking with a lawyer yeah. first. And <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think, um, so one of the things that I think, and I don't know the answer because I don't like it when people use terms inaccurately and that's mm -hmm. the like elitist, the Harvard elitist in me talking. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of pulled to Warren because I want the terms to be right. Um, but, uh, but, you know, look, so much of the, so the, the whole Chicago school, and this is like, I wrote this, my original chapter on the Chicago school was like, it was a band of, of, of men who felt put upon and they were, they were trying to understand the origin of freedom and gradually they got corrupted. And then like, that was like, I wrote a bunch of drafts of that chapter and then someone was like, you know, really you should not look at Bork, you should look at the guy who taught him, Aaron Director. Sure. And it turns out Aaron Director is just like a cynical guy who was just like, no, we're, we're, this is an operation, this is a marketing operation from the beginning and we're gonna take advantage of, of insecure liberals and we're gonna make them feel stupid by telling them that when they use the term monopoly or monopolization, that they don't understand economics. So they, they should be scared and they should defer to mm -hmm. us. And it worked, mm -hmm. right? It worked. He learned, he didn't learn economics. He learned, he learned rhetoric from H.L. Mencken, who mm -hmm. was a snob. And that's like the whole Chicago school is about intimidating people yes. into yeah. not, into being afraid. It's a culture of deference. It's what yeah. Gordon talked about, a pre-revolutionary yeah. culture of deference. So I really dislike that culture of deference. And I don't think we should be pedantic I guess I talked myself into saying okay. we shouldn't be pedantic about, about <laughs> monopolization. Brandeis and Milton Friedman actually had the same definition, which is a monopoly is unified control of an industry, right? So it's unified control. It doesn't mean it has to be one institution. It could be multiple ones. But if they're like kind of colluding or they're, they're concentrated enough, I don't, I don't over, I don't care if you use monopoly to describe an industry where there are three players. Okay, yeah. Um, you both talked about the, the Emerging a consumer welfare standard in the 70s, you said, you know, should we all be expecting to pay more for, uh, for toothpaste? Diamond technology and, you know, when AWS came, came around, instead of having to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars buying servers in advance, you could just be rented by an hour. It's a tremendous benefit. There's a lot of stuff that is a you know, tremendous consumer benefit. And I remember reading something years ago about Walmart, Walmart price famously. You know, Walmart would just tell their suppliers, DVD player costs 49 bucks. Come up with one that we can you know, sell at that price. So the consumers definitely benefit. So how do you, how do we move away from, you know, Facebook is free, Instagram is free. How do we move away from that? Is there a way that you see other than the, the big bad government has told you this is bad, you're gonna pay more for toothpaste, you're gonna pay for Facebook, you're gonna pay for uh, certain other things, when you see these very tangible short-term benefits or is there a way to is there a way to get people to understand that this is in their best interest in the long run, and possibly even in the short run, uh, even if it's a case where you may be paying more on one brand of toothpaste today because they're selling at way below cost and driving the local uh, pharmacy out of business? It's, it's a really hard political problem. I think you have to make the political case for that. Um, because, so there's, a, one thing that's really interesting, so, so Google now has a lot of control in educational software markets, right? Yes. And the reason is because 
the existing software packages were not very good and were expensive and it was hard to buy them. Microsoft was selling some of them, but it's like Google stuff was free and it worked. And that's like what you see in a lot of these, uh, in a lot of industries is kind of not very good products. And then one of the few companies that is not controlled by private equity, uh, like a Walmart or a, a Google or, a, or an Amazon will come in and like, and like make a product that works, right? And I think that's such a big part of the problem where it's like the rest of our industries have been destroyed by private equity and financialization. And so the few companies that are not financialized have such an advantage because they can actually do things in a reasonable way. They're not always trying to hit their next quarterly numbers. And so that's like the, the driving path. It's like kind of like a forest that's like totally dry. Like it's just dry timber and then you know, Amazon just runs in there with the with the fire and creates a big forest fire. It's like these guys shouldn't like there should have been a good educational software package already, right? But there wasn't. So Google went in there and just did it. And that's true in lots of different industries because we've destroyed the ability to compete. I think in terms of the consumer problem, I mean, we're going to have to rebuild the ability to actually start and run businesses, and and that's going to have to be very deliberate and and. In some cases, we're going to have to bring in, like if we want to build aircraft again, we're going to probably have to bring in foreign experts to teach us how to do the things that we once taught them how to do. There's just a lot of physical things that we can't do in this country anymore. And so in some ways, what China, what, what Walmart was doing is they were saying, I want a DVD for $49. And then we got it from the free market, which is actually state capitalism in China. Well, that game is over. So prices are going up no matter what. And we're going to have to relocate our supply chains. So the question isn't, our price is going to go up. The question is always about power. We only, unfortunately, have time for one more question. Yes. Oh, me? Great. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, Matt, uh, I gather uh, that you're not a fan of Andrew Yang, uh, which, like, admittedly, he um, doesn't seem to have a very firm grasp on monopoly, or at least it doesn't seem to be something he thinks is important. I've seen that in some of the debates. But given the really interesting back and forth that you guys had about how even if you had open markets, there are some communities that don't have access to capital, and that's also a big problem. Uh, do, do either of you guys think that a universal basic income is like an interesting or, or possible solution to that problem? So, so, I, so it's interesting, because I was, when I was doing research on this contest thing, um, one of the, the kind of black media entrepreneurs that I was talking to was like, this is why Andrew Yang is getting so much popularity. And I was like, oh, that makes sense, right? Oh, yeah, because money, money in our society is freedom. And he's the only one really hating that, just saying you should have money. Not saying, hey, you should have money because money's fun to have, but you should have freedom. That's what he's really saying. And I was like, oh, that makes a lot of sense. He's a con artist, right? Like, he's a total con artist. Everything he says is just middle brow Davos. Um, fourth generation like industrialization is total bullshit, and that was actually a term that he uses. But it's also a term that was coined by the creator of Davos. Like that creator of Davos, you, like his book's name was called the Fourth Industrial Revolution or something. It was just mm -hmm. stupid. But he's the only one who's getting to that problem. And I've changed my view on him from he's a con artist to he's an effective con artist. <laughs> <laughs> But I don't think that, so I don't think that universal basic income works because it's income, but I do think, that, so Thomas Paine wrote about this, and um, he was actually the progenitor of Social Security. I think you should get a large chunk of money when you're 18 or 21, right? And it should be funded by an inheritance tax. And you should be able to do what you want with it. And what most people will do with it is they will use it for education or they will use it to start a business. So I wouldn't say that you shouldn't have income. I think children should get an, an income allowance. I think that's, but people who can't work should get that. But I do think that, that what people want is not the dole. What people want is the ability to have political and economic independence. So they should have access to capital. Um, and I think that's really important. I just wouldn't do it with the, the income. And the, the, I guess the final reason for that is that when you think, like, like a job is just something that we give people green pieces of paper to, like we give people green pieces of paper to solve a problem and we call that a job. If you say, oh, there aren't gonna be any more jobs, what you're saying is there are no more problems, right? And who thinks there are no more problems? Rich tech bros who look around the world and say, I don't have any more problems, right? You take, go anywhere in this country and it, it, there are a lot of problems to solve, right? So the idea that we don't have any problems and therefore we need a universal basic income is, is crazy. Um, the other thing is that the reason Andrew Yang is peddling this automation thing is 
is because we are afraid of the future. And the reason we're afraid of the future is because every time there's been a technological advance in, the, in our lifetimes, it's been used to control us, to manipulate us. That's not how technology always has been deployed, but that's how we've experienced the deployment of technology. So we're afraid of the future. And the scare story he's telling, and that a lot of people are telling, it's not just him, is, is oh my God, we're going to have robots that are going to make anything we need. That's like a scare story. <laughs> That's crazy, right? Mm -hmm. So what, really what the issue is, he's taking advantage of our fear of the future, right? To just get famous so he can make some money. And I don't, you know, whatever, I respect the player, right? It's fun. <laughs> um, but I think underlying that, we have to recognize that we are afraid of the future because technology has been deployed against our interests by concentrated mm -hmm. capital. And that there is a really serious problem with access to freedom. And, and, mm -hmm. And, that, and, and capital represents, access to capital does represent access to free. Thank you very much to uh, Justin, to the Stone House, to the stand-up comic, great historian. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, uh, for those of you who haven't read his book, read it. For those of you who have, take it to your lawmakers. It is actually very empowering uh, to know our history and to know what is possible. Can so. I just say one thing? So yeah. uh, I might say who, but one senator gave it to another senator as a secret Santa gift. <laughs> <laughs> they, they do secret Santa in the Senate. Take it to your daycare, give it as a secret Santa to the two-year-olds. And there are copies, Freedom. For, there are copies <laughs> for sale downstairs, and Matt can hang around and sign them. So get a copy and then ask them the question you can get to ask it as a sign of the book. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Yes. Well, I know that people who are already interested, like Generis is interested.